Dr. Caroline Habshin is an infant psychiatrist at CASA Child, Adolescent, and Family Mental Health. She provides assessment and treatment for infants and preschool children with mental health and developmental difficulties. Dr. Hapshin is also the medical director of the Autism Clinic at the Glen Rose and is a clinical professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the University of Alberta. She is past president of the Alberta Association for Infant Mental Health, which is a society for education of clinicians and advocacy for infant and mental health. Her work supports fostering communities where all infants can grow and flourish in every area of their development and where there is a widespread awareness and commitment to ensuring that infants' primary care relationships and environments are stable and health and safe. So please join me in welcoming a mentor of mine and someone who is truly committed to this field, Dr. Carol Ann Hatchen. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Good morning and welcome to this series. Uh, before I start, I'm going to put a plug in for a colleague, Evelyn Watherspoon, and her talk on this series. And I would suggest that you watch her talk on early uh, childhood development first because she kind of sets me up very nicely. So, um, so our, our talk today is about infant mental health. Um, and um, I have a cool title, Baby Steps and Giant Leaps. Uh, because we have made major gains in the field over the course of my career. And so I'm very excited this morning to share that with you. So the objectives I've um, outlined here, first of all, I'm going to review a framework uh, that helps us understand brain development and function. And I'm going to define toxic stress in a very uh, clear way that will help us all sort out when we are experiencing too much or toxic stress. And then I'm going to highlight the importance of early uh, child um, and caregiver relationships. And the focus of uh, the beginning of the talk is going to be about healthy brain development, because I think it's really important to understand how the brain is built and what well-being and health is. And then we understand um, atypical development or challenges for children and caregivers in that context. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, red flags, uh, for um, indications that children are struggling and I'll end with a quick review of how we actually do our assessment and what sorts of interventions we offer for young children and families. So um, the talk is based on a, um, an integration of two um, sets of uh, information. The first is the neurorelational framework so I've given you this reference um, and I'm going to give you the overview synopsis of a very weighty uh, dense book. Um, and then the other set of ideas comes from the uh, Harvard Center on the Developing Child and the translation of that science by Frameworks Institute. Um, this, is, this information may be familiar to many of you uh, as the Norlean Foundation through the Alberta Family Wellness Initiatives has described the core story to Albertans. Um, and I've given you the website. If you haven't been there, go there. Many, many good lectures available for you to look at, as well as resources. So here's the three parts of the, um, the, the talk this morning. The first is section is going to be about brain building. And so I'm going to weave together the core story and the NRF, the Neuro Relational Framework. Um, and so I, I've, I exp I've been thinking of different titles, like should I call it the core story plus the core story expanded. Um, it's, it's, um, if you have any great ideas, let me know. Um, the next section is going to be about red flags. And I've uh, called this, this section, what are the wobbles? And you'll see where the wobbles metaphor comes from later. And then the next part um, is assessment and intervention. So uh, the metaphor uh, for this morning is uh, how the brain is built. So I'm going to do an uh, overview description of brain building. And I'm going to spend a long time about the foundation and the components of the foundation, which include sleep, uh, recovery from stress, what toxic stress is, and then that functional description, and um, the importance of self-regulation and co-regulation. And then I'm going to tell you um, how the brain gets built, what gets built, 
um, and then um, uh, the metaphor about child children's mental health and resiliency. So the first metaphor uh, of the morning is the metaphor of brain architecture. So the brain is built uh, from the beginning in utero and begins and continues throughout life. So that's a very optimistic message. Our brains can change throughout the lifespan. So like a house, the foundation is laid first and then we build up in a predictable organized sequence. And early experiences shape how the brain is built. So all factors in the environment are important. And a strong, a, a strong foundation in the early years increases the probability of positive outcomes for the future. If the foundation is weak, then there are less optimal outcomes for the future, potentially. And I've included the, the reference there to Brain Builders, a lovely little video which is available online, which summarizes the core story. So brains are built from the bottom up and skill begets skill. So if, if we don't wire up in the sequence, then later skills may falter. Um, and then the other important, uh, important uh, factor is that we, um, I have many times I have parents ask me, well, what's more important than the others? What part of the brain is more important? Or if this part isn't as strong, what, what's going to happen? Well, all parts are intertwined and all functions are intertwined in the brain. So you can't do one without the others. And I'm going to add to the, our brain metaphor. We talk a lot about the brain and the mind, but the brain is actually the distributed nervous system throughout the entire body. So it's our brain connected to our whole nervous system. So when I'm talking about the brain, I'm referring to everything. And just to emphasize this metaphor, brain house. Brain equals house. So just keep thinking about that throughout this uh, lecture. And this house we created at um, Infant Preschool Services at CASA. And we use this um, diagram to talk to our families about their children's development. So laying a strong foundation. What I tell families is that sleep is absolutely essential for physical and mental health. If children do not sleep, then their development is undermined in all ways. So brains need enough sleep. They need the right timing for sleep, so regular times to fall asleep and wake up, and quality of sleep, so not interrupted too much. So when the brain is restored by sleep, then we have a better chance of managing stress throughout the day. So our brain and body adapt to stress throughout the day. And if you meditate, actually, that really helps <laughs> brain development and for, for children, it helps their brain development and uh, helps us adults manage. So here's one way of looking at stress uh, definitions. So positive stress happens throughout the day. We, have, we experience elevations in heart rate and blood pressure. It sets us up to be more alert in the environment and to monitor what's coming in. Tolerable stress happens when there are serious events that um, are... Um, causing us to experience stress responses, but we um, adapt and those responses are buffered by the relationships of, uh, with others around us. Uh, toxic stress occurs when our system is overloaded or overwhelmed, and, it, and this occurs often in the absence of protective relationships or protective communities around us. So here's another way of understanding stress. And I think for us, uh, clinically, working with families, and I think uh, for frontline workers of um, all uh, um, kinds in the field, it's helpful to look at stress in, in the way that I'm going to now describe. Um, so what I'm going to show you is a definition of stress responses. And this is actually taken from um, how our bodies and brains work together. So there's two main ways that our brain can respond to stress in the environment. One is to slow down, hit the brakes. The other is to step on the gas. So our nervous system, our firing, actually speeds up. And we go back and forth um, between different stress responses throughout the day. And the function of this is for us to kind of adjust and get to being just right, so that we're in a calm, 
alert processing state most of the day. So uh, for those of you who did print out the handouts, um, I want you to have this one out. Um, this is a way of us conceptualizing a continuum of states of being awake um, to sleep and the stress responses we experience. So on the one side we have when we're asleep um, and then we wake up and some of us wake up and we're alert and ready to go and other, uh, others of us experience kind of being out of it and a bit drowsy to being hypo alert uh, where the brakes are still a bit on and then we rouse and we're in a state of being awake and just right hopefully for most of the day and we call this the green zone. Um, and then when things happen through the day that might alert us and make us a bit stressed, we will experience a stress response of being hyper alert. Um, and then if something really untoward happens that uh, gears us up and the brakes are on full blast, we may be in a flooded state. So I'm going to channel uh, Dr. Lillis, the author of the Neuro Relational Framework next, to describe um, the three uh, main stress responses, being hypo-alert, hyper-alert, and flooded. Children who have, children who have experienced some type of trauma often have symptoms of ADD. These difficult behaviors are really stress responses and it's up to us to figure out what is causing these stress responses and there's several different pathways that they can show us that they're distressed. The first stress response is a hypersensitive, hyperreactive stress response and these infants cry a lot, are inconsolable. When they become toddlers they may go into rapid temper tantrums and be very volatile. A second stress response are infants who are hypervigilant. These infants will have very wide eyes and will be very vigilantly looking and you can see that there's an anxiety in their muscle tone and in how they carry themselves and that they're scanning the environment. A toddler may be overly clingy or overly withdrawn. A third stress response would be very shut down and tuned out. These children, again, may be misunderstood as a good, easy baby. So the first uh, stress response that Dr. Lillis described with the baby that was intensely crying, that infant was flooded. Um, the second infant, the, and she's changed her names, uh, so actually, so this tape was done before uh, she uh, revised some of the terminology. So the first state is flooded, the second uh, state where she described the infant as hypervigilant, that's hyper alert stress response, and then the last one was hypo alert. Um, so what I do when I'm meeting with families is I show them two um, diagrams. I show them the continuum of stress responses and states and I show them uh, the diagram on the screen and actually I flip it around like this so if you flip it around like this you actually match up the stress responses on the continuum with a very clear description of what the child looks like when they're in uh, one of the stress responses and what we've done over the last year with Dr. Lillis partnering with us is we've modified the language. So the language in the handout that actually comes with the book is um, quite wordy and, and the words aren't actually understandable, some of them, unless you know you're in the field. So we've taken it and put it in plain English and we're actually using these two handouts with our families to, so that they can identify behaviors not, and relabel and re-understand them as stress responses and not just behaviors with a negative connotation. Uh, so look through um, this diagram that I have up because it, it gives a very clear description of each stress response. And this, these descriptions are kind of set up for uh, understanding stress responses in children, but if you actually look at them and think about them from your own perspective as an adult, we actually have very similar behaviors as adults when we are in these three stress responses of being flooded hyper alert or hypo alert. So now I'm going to give you a definition of toxic stress, um, a different definition. And so when we are in a state of being overloaded with our stress responses, 
um, what happens is we are experiencing these stress responses too frequently or too quickly, so zero to 100, um, or we can't adapt to normal challenges or transitions. So what we see uh, in young children is that transitions throughout the day, which happen every day, every day they have a bathroom break, and every day they have a stress response, that's a not a normal or typical kind of adaptation to a typical challenge. Um, stress responses that last too long, so more than 10 to 20 minutes, is too long. And generally within the body, there's a, a, a response that calms our stress responses, and it usually kicks in in about 20 minutes. So longer than 20 minutes means that the, the child or the individual is being flooded with stress hormones, which is not good for our bodies or brains. So the first three, uh, Dr. Lillis calls load conditions, so that if children are experiencing this uh, too long, too, too fast, too frequent, um, then, um, but they are getting back to green zone part of the day, then we don't worry quite so much. But still, these are severe stress responses and potentially toxic stress. Um, the worst situation is when the child cannot recover and get back to being green during the day. So children who do not sleep well at night and who have very limited bits of time during the day where they are actually in a calm, alert processing state, we worry a lot about these children because they are experiencing toxic stress. So now I'm going to talk about how we help children manage these stress responses. So children don't come into the world being able to manage their stress responses. Infants and young children need adults to help them regulate themselves. So when we, when we learn over time ways to cope and manage our stress responses, we call that self-regulation. And the need for others to help us is co-regulation. And we do as adults co-regulate each other throughout the day. You guys right now are actually co-regulating me with your smiles and your nodding and your um, kind attention. So that's helping me stay in a calm alert processing state. So that is an example of co-regulation. So what we teach our, our parents is that first they have to recognize their own stress responses and then figure out ways for them to maintain a calm, alert processing state and then recognize their child's stress responses and then figure out ways to help their child regulate back to a calm state. And we call that, we use the phrase, help your child organize their feelings. And we stress that if a parent is able to do that as best as they can, then they're really helping their child not get overloaded and experience those states of toxic stress. And here's a picture that helps us um, kind of visualize this. So when we come into the world, um, on the one side of the, the diagram there, there's the small end of the cone. So that's our initial capacity to self-regulate. And so we need the others around us to help us with co-regulation. And as we mature through the lifespan, we develop more capacity for self-regulation, but we still always need others to help us co-regulate. And one of the residents that I was working with uh, a few years ago looked at this diagram and she said, and then it flips as we get older. And in old age, we have less capacity to self-regulate again, and we need more of others helping us. And this would also be true during times where um, uh, we may be very ill. So next section here, how does the brain get built? I think I've already described to you that infants are very dependent on adults to help them manage these stress responses and to help them get into good sleep cycles. This is laying the strong foundation. Then the next step is us helping infants and young children share their experiences and feelings, and this is how we learn about the world. So one of the key ingredients for brain building is serve and return. And so it's the back and forth between caregivers and children that helps build the brain. And we talk about circles of communication, back and forth, round and round. And this is what helps uh, young children learn. Uh, so the metaphor here of serve and return came from tennis. Talking with lots of families out there, Serve and return, I mean, some families and parents know tennis and they like tennis, and, but I think the metaphor of hockey and 
actually in our community goes over a bit better. So passing the puck back and forth, uh, especially with dads, they like this one. Um, and so then we say the passing the back and forth is the babbling, is the facial expressions, uh, it's the eye contact, those are the key ingredients. And we also use the phrase from Circle of Security um, called, um, or being with. So it's a nice way of us explaining to parents um, that they need to be with uh, their child in this sharing of joy moment by moment every day. Um, and the other way that we explain um, serve and return to parents is by using um, this actual handout where we, we break it down. What, what actually are the ingredients of serve and return? And we call this nuts and bolts, and this actually comes from Deanne Benoit, Modified uh, Interaction Guidance, which is a strategy I'll tell you about a bit later. Um, so we help parents understand they have to be at their child's level, their faces need to be aligned, there needs to be eye contact, the parent presenting a positive face is essential um, and responding immediately and warmly to the, to the child. So here's another way to look at serve and return and break it down into the steps. Um, this comes from the neurorelational framework. And you can see I've labeled the slides. Some have CS, that means core story is the metaphor that it's come from, and NRF, uh, neurorelational framework. So step one is getting calm together. So that's actually establishing that the green part of my house, the green zone, calm and alert together. And then when calm, being able to share um, facial expressions and eye contact. And then when able to do that, uh, sharing joy back and forth. And at that point, usually in development, caregivers and young children fall in love with each other and we call that attachment. Um, and then when sharing joy and being able to have that, that love back and forth, that we have the actual circles of communication that start non-verbally. And then when in that flow of back and forth and back and forth, the infant is able to read the cues, um, the gestures and the nonverbal facial expressions of the adult and vice versa. So then reading those cues, then the next step is actually being able to share feelings. So you can see it's a, it's a linear progression of capacities. Um, and then when the child is able to share feelings back and forth and understand that, that the adult has different feelings from themselves, then we have the start of pretend and uh, other symbolic capacities which include language, labeling uh, things in the environment and sharing ideas with language. And then the next step after that is actually being able to make sense of the world and problem solve with others. So if we can't be calm together and share joy at the very beginning of the bottom of the ladder, then we have difficulties as we move through the top. So the other key ingredient that families often ask about is uh, the nature aspect. Genes, how much does their child's brain development have to do with genes? And so we all inherit genes from our two parents, um, and it's luck of the draw, what we get. We don't, any of us choose the genes we get. Um, but the environment signs for how those genes are going to actually work, how they're turned on and off. And so the environment is a key ingredient in combination with the genes um, to um, determine what kind of development is going to unfold. So here's the house. Um, back to our, our diagram here. So the layers of the house uh, build up from the bottom up and the pillars of the house are the two metaphors of you can't do one without the other and skills build upon skills. And then we've incorporated the metaphor of serve and return and sharing joy with the heart wrapped around the house, the house representing the, the child's brain. So now I'm going to go through and describe what brain systems get built. Because this is really important when we're trying to uh, figure out children's challenges. And I find that when I describe this uh, to families, then they can better understand how to fit in the child's challenges and strengths. So four brain systems or networks. Um, this is um, a, a way of trying to simplify a very complex organ, our brain. So the first is a system that manages our body. 
um, and helps, helps us stay in a healthy balance. The second system is our sensory system. Third system is the, the network that organizes our emotions or feelings. And the fourth system is uh, higher problem solving and help, helps us organize language and uh, our learning. And the fourth system is, is essential to help us adapt to the environment. So we're going to build block by block in the house. Uh, and the body brain system and that foundation of sleep and stress recovery are actually um, one, one network. But I've split them off into two here to, to help describe um, this, um, this network. So um, the body uh, brain system actually helps manage uh, how we feel throughout the day and, and our physical health. So for young infants, they're wiring up whether they're thirsty, this, the feeling of whether they're thirsty or not thirsty, hungry or full, stomach empty or full, whether they're hot or cold, whether they're in pain or not, um, and whether they feel sick or well. So from the very beginning, infants are wiring up memories of these feelings. And then we're specifically wiring up what we call visceral sensations or the sensations of the inside uh, organs of the body. And so, and, and, and laying down memories of what it feels like for bladder and, body and bowel to be full or empty. Um, passing gas, common feeling we have every day. Whether our hearts are being fast or slow, whether the rhythm is steady or not. Breathing fast, uh, slow, big breaths in or shallow. Um, they're listening to their own voices as to whether the quality is loud or soft and all the other components of that. Um, and then where their body is in space um, and whether they're moving or not. Muscles tensed or relaxed. So all these sensations from the inside of the body are being wired up very early on. And if the infant is being co-regulated well, then mostly they're on the positive side of these feelings. If the child is experiencing medical illness, or not being co-regulated, then there may be more negative memories laid down as to how their body feels inside. So, important thing to remember here that this is, all of us, we kind of take it for granted, but every day these sensations are what helps us know how we are and how, we, how it is actually to be alive and in the world. So the next system that wires up is taking information from the outside world. And we do this through our senses. So there's two components to sense uh, sensation. One is sensory processing. And this happens when we get energy in from the environment and we translate it through a very complicated process in our nervous system and it changes it into sensations. So the actual sensations we all experience, unless we have challenges, um, are hearing, vision, touch, both light touch and deep pressure, capacity to taste and smell, awareness of where our body is in space, balance, and uh, the last sensation is being able to deter determine whether we're in pain or not. So that's sensory processing. Sensory modulation is when the brain takes that information and balances it out in an appropriate way. So the example I often give is that you're not noticing that you're sitting on your bottoms in your seats until now I just mentioned it because your brain was not paying attention to that because it's not really relevant at the current time. So that's an example of sensory modulation. Uh, so it, modulation helps us sort out, is the information coming in too fast, too slow, too much, too little, too short, too long, and it helps balance it all out. So our senses give information about the outside world. So we have two brain systems we we've talked about, information from the inside world, information coming in from the outside world. So the next brain system that wires up is the system that manages our emotions. Um, and so early in development, babies are sorting out those experiences from the inside and the outside and wiring up those experiences and those memories with how it feels, the emotions that they feel and connect. And that helps us sort out what we're going to pay attention to over time. Is the world a happy place? positive, I feel comfy and co-regulated, or is the world an uncomfortable place inside and out? 
and I'm building negative memories of these experiences. And then over time, as we build these memories, we balance out these experiences. Um, so what emotions do, do, children feel, do children feel? Same as what we feel. Why, these emotions wire up very, very early in development before the first year. Um, happy, sad, angry, disgusted, surprised, afraid. Um, and infants very early on are sorting out the facial expressions and feelings of other people. And sorting out, is the other feeling the same as me or something different? And what does this emotion or experience mean to me? And what does it mean to you? And is it important or not? Should I pay attention to it or not? And this is for better, for worse, positive or negative. So, and then further on in development in the third, fourth and fifth years of life, young children learn moral emotions. These emotions are learned and they are taught by adults. So the emotions of pride, guilt, shame and embarrassment. So this brain system um, of sorting out emotions is the system that helps us make meaning of the world and the meaning of our behaviors. So last system to wire up is the executive system. And the metaphor from the core story is that of air traffic control. Um, and I've had many people tell me that they like this part of the brain building uh, video the best. It's a, it's a little helicopter flying in and out. It's, it's quite cute. Um, so this part of the brain helps us make real-time, real-world, flexible and adaptive actions. What we're going to do, how we're going to do it, when we're going to do it. Um, it's, we're firing here all the time throughout the day. And we're firing well if we're in a calm, alert processing state. So this is what the, the part of our body that guides our movements, focuses our attention, organizes ideas helps us create interesting ideas um, and also this part of the brain is highly linked to our emotional brain um, and helps us manage our emotions. So here's my cute, I love the Fisher Place Price Airport. It's very nostalgic for me. Um, so executive system is uh, the top of the house. It helps us integrate all the information from below. So. What I explained to parents is, is that this part of the brain doesn't wire up as well if the rest of the house is struggling, if the rest of the brain systems aren't working as well. And we, we sure don't uh, think and problem solve well during the day if we haven't had a good sleep and if we're in one of those stress responses. Um, and when I explain this to families, then it, it, they, it, it's usually a, a, you know, a aha, that makes lots of sense um, and, and they can relate to it personally as well. Um, and so all this work of integration of these four brain systems, the purpose of it is so that we have um, a mechanism to adapt and achieve our goals and have appropriate social behaviors. And the executive system takes the longest to develop, which is kind of good news and bad news at the same time. It takes a long time. It requires lots of co-regulation from adults for a long time. Um, and then the other important message about executive functioning is that um, Children need to play. Children need to play and do make-believe and role-play to build this part of their brains. And adult-led play can be helpful, but they need time with their peers playing. So this is the world premiere of this little video. Um, my son did it for me. So, and it's quite cool. So this is a representation of the four brain systems and kind of a way for you to understand the complexity. So the four walls of the house represent the four brain systems. The foundation is stress uh, uh, or sleep and stress re recovery. And the very bottom found, uh, below the foundation is there's the phrase bottom up and on the roof top down. So all four brain systems have bottom up components and top down. and it turns, but there's no music to it. So that's the next step. Oh, and then the other part of the house. So we're trying to figure out how do we represent the social emotional ladder. And so there's the ladder in the middle and then the little floating hearts of serve and return. 
So here's a way of representing, so this is the second house. So the first house um, describes the brain systems, and then this house has some phrases in it um, to try and capture uh, the idea of what is actually a healthy brain. Um, so uh, at the bottom, I can recover from stress, and I have healthy sleep, um, and then my body is as healthy as it can be, and, and some of us have health challenges, so it's not that we're aiming for perfect health, there's no such thing. Um, next, I can adapt to sensations. I love others, I'm hopeful and optimistic. And at the top, I can communicate in whichever way I can. Uh, I can learn and solve problems, and I can move as best as I can. So those are the components of a healthy, of a healthy brain. Again, in the context of sharing joy with others and being able to participate and serve in return. So now we're going to move into mental health and a bit more description of challenges. So the mental health of a child uh, is what enables uh, him or her to function um, at uh, his or her best and meet potential. And so just as um, a table is functional, the mental health of a child is help what helps them function. So we have the metaphor of levelness, um, so the level levelness of a table. And so the idea here is a table can't kind of fix itself it ha if it has wobbles. It needs the environment to respond. Uh, it needs a floor that's level, uh, or um, it needs experts to help fix and make it more level and stable. So the metaphor here for mental health challenges is wobbles, wobbles in the levelness of a table. So um, I'm going to be talking about wobbles next. What are the wobbles that we see? and how do we assess and intervene for wobbles in young children. So in, on our team at uh, CASA Infant Preschool Services, we are using um, the NRF to help guide us in our assessment and treatment of young children. Um, and so we have three steps that we go through um, to understand children's challenges. So the first is sorting out with uh, the child and the family whether or not they are experiencing toxic stress or overload, are social, uh, social emotional milestones being achieved, and uh, where are their struggles uh, and strengths in the four brain systems. And I think it's important to know uh, that when we're looking at stress responses, we're, if we're concerned that there is uh, a load condition or toxic stress, that puts us on alert as to the severity of the child's challenges. Um, and we're looking for those red flags um, in the relationship of the parent and the child. Um, and then if there's problems in steps one and two, then what are the reasons? Why are there struggles in steps one and two? So um, part of what we're trying to achieve is helping um, our colleagues in the community as well as our families understand that we can all be aware of stress responses um, and whether the child is in the green zone. And so on our team now, we actually use this metaphor regularly every day uh, in co-regulating each other. So talking to each other as, as clinicians, are you in the green zone? And if you're not, well, why? And what can we do to help? And then likewise, monitoring our, the children we see and their parents as to whether they're in the green zone. And likewise, I think it's really important to note that we can identify um, for uh, parents and, and all of us can identify whether or not children are meeting their social emotional milestones. And I think Evelyn talked about this um, in, in her presentation that we focus a lot on language milestones and motor milestones and I think we need to pay way more attention and focus on social emotional milestones. Uh, so that we're all aware and can identify them and support this development. Um, and so as mental health cl uh, clinicians, we have to collaborate with all our partners to um, assess the four brain systems. And so we need um, other disciplines. So for example, with the sensory system, we rely on uh, our, our colleagues in occupational therapy. So I think I've made a, an argument here for thinking about behavior in a different way, for thinking about behavior as the child's attempt to regulate stress responses. Um, behavior is the way the child's trying to regulate themselves. And that behaviors can be due to be development being off track or developmental delays. 
Um, and also behavior can be due to the caregiver not meeting the child's needs. So those problems in co-regulation. Um, so behavior is just not behavior and it's not good or bad. And I think by making those judgments, we don't necessarily help children. I think it's, I would advocate for us looking at behavior as being complex. So how do we assess for wobbles? So what I'm going to describe now is kind of our sequence of what we do as clinicians. And so using the, the principles of brain development, the, the kind of the basic core story, and now our enhanced core, core story with the neurorelational framework, um, and also understanding um, this in the context of a hierarchy of needs. And so when I presented this talk actually at um, um, Children's Services site at Rundle, one of the workers said to me, this sounds a lot like um, Maslow and a hierarchy of needs. So I thought, I'm going to pop this in because some of you may be thinking about this as I'm presenting. Um, and so just as we have a hierarchy of needs of psychological development, as Maslow described many years ago, we also have a hierarchy of needs of brain development, and that guides us for how we do our assessment and, and where we prioritize intervention. So what we've created on our team, and there was just a little blurry bit of it on the, the two slides ago, we've actually created what we call a priorities flow chart. And so this, we, we pull this out when we're doing our case conferencing, and when we're um, trying to understand the, fam the cases, the, uh, the situations that we're seeing, and we go through in order uh, as to where we are. So the bottom uh, foundation of the house and priorities of assessment and, and intervention is whether there is safety and security uh, for the family. And so this includes um, basic needs of housing, food and clothing. Is there a risk of harm for any family member? And what is happening with the parent's mental health, the parent's physical health, dental health, we include dental, because I had a chat with a wonderful dentist in Calgary many years ago who convinced me that dental health has to be part of the course story. And I'm and, and daughter of a dentist, so that was the easy sell. Um, so um, are elements of the parent's health, holistic health, affecting the child's safety and security? So we sort this out first and we stop here and engage our partners if we need to, if there are concerns at this level. So next uh, in the foundation uh, is, is the child sleeping? Is the parent sleeping? Because if no one's sleeping in the family, then it's going to be hard to go for it. And then what about efficient recovery from stress responses? Is the child in a low condition, overloaded, overwhelmed, in a state of toxic stress, or is the parent or parents in a state of toxic stress? And one thing I didn't show you before, and which I'll insert right now, is um, a, an, an additional visual of the elastic band. So this is my bracelet of the morning. So when we recover efficiently from stress, it's like an elastic band being stretched, so hypoalert, hyperalert, flooded, but we come back to uh, green. We come back to being just right. And so like an elastic band being stretched, it's flexible, it's stable, we can get back to being a healthy, functional elastic band. Um, however, if children experience toxic stress for long periods of time, and the band is stretched and stretched and stretched, and not in one of those low conditions where it's not coming back to green, then you can see over time there's this elastic band that used to hold broccoli. Uh, and has been stretched and stretched from other uses, it's not coming back to its flexible, stable, green position. So efficient recovery from stress responses is essential. So, And we actually are developing ways to kind of map this out for parents and children and show them visually. How much of the day are you green? How, much, how many times a day red? We have parents trying to map this out. And parents are often looking at hyper alert and, and flooded stress responses, because those are quite uh, visible and noticeable, but we're also having them pay attention to when their child is hypoalert, so when they crawled up in a ball under the table, when they've gone off and they're doing repetitive activities in the corner, when they're zoning out and looking glazed over like that little baby in the video. Um, so we're having parents pay attention and, and then come back and tell us from week to week. And we know that we're being successful if there's more green zone and if there's more sharing of joy back and forth. 
So we also pay attention for young children about feeding, toileting, and uh, also sort out uh, physical health issues. Many of the young children that come to us on our team have struggles in all of the above. So this is where we start. And these are often um, very common presenting concerns for families with young children. Uh, so our team knows a lot about feeding and toileting. And we actually, um, so uh, our families uh, will tell you that they come to us and we will pull out a chart uh, with pictures of poop. And if you want to Google it, it's the Bristol stool chart for children. And we have it, and, and our therapists actually have it laminated now so that we can pull it out. So we, we get to the nitty gritty because that's where we need to start with the foundation. And then, of course, the sensory system is hugely important. And I've indicated that if, uh, if there's severe difficulties with sensory processing or modulation, we call in our occupational therapy friends to help out. So next brain system that wires up is feelings. And so we start uh, with trying to understand the environment, the context around the child. So how is the parent's mental health, sibling mental health, and family functioning around the, the individual child? How is everyone doing with their feelings and their emotional states? And then we sort out the development of the child so far as the executive system, fine and gross motor, speech, language, and intellectual capacities, strengths, and challenges in all those areas. Uh, and then when we've done all that, and we've sorted that out from an assessment perspective, then we're ready to sort out um, what is happening with serve and return in the parent-child relationship. Um, and is the child achieving the social emotional milestones in, with each individual parent, primary caregiver, um, and with others that they may have relationships with. Because children have, will show different capacities socially and emotionally with their caregivers at school or childcare or in the home. Because it's a, it's, um, a dyadic, it's a two-person event, this serve and return. And so now I'm going to show you a quick example of uh, serve and return. And I, I think Evelyn has shown this one as well, but I, I like this one because it's got a narrative that helps you understand what's happening. So I want you to watch the positive serve and return. Look for those nuts and bolts that I told you about before. And then in the second part where the parent puts a still face on, which is extremely stressful to the child, then you will watch for stress responses. And Dr. Tronic narrates it. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I mean, like, girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, 
Oh, he had so would be good. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly scene. So I think that I, I like that video because it really clearly highlights um, the green zone and that positive serve and return that's happening, sharing circles of joy, and the infant is functioning at her best, right? As is the as is the mom. And then when there's the stress of the still face, then you you quickly see the child progress to hyper alert and then flooded. Um, and we could argue if we microanalyzed it, there might be a few spots there where she was kind of, she was looking up and away and she was still. And we could, could make an argument for hypo alert at that point. So the brakes and the gas out of, out of kilter and stress response is being geared up to that situation. And then you see the, the wonderful capacity of co-regulation back to, back to green very quickly when the mom comes back and is responsive. So it highlights the importance of co-regulation. It highlights the importance of the parent, of the importance of the parent being in that green zone, uh, in facilitating social emotional milestones. And uh, Dr. Tronic says it so nicely that the the ugly is when we can't get back to green, and so that child, children that are in that position, are exper are experiencing toxic stress. And there, that elastic band is just being stretched and stretched and stretched. So uh, back to our story of wobbles. Uh, so one way of describing wobbles is to use labels or diagnoses. And we have discussions about this daily on our team. And mostly what we are doing on our team is describing function, describing strengths and challenges for parents and children. Um, and we do use diagnoses as well to capture um, um, wobbles. So two diagnostic cat, um, manuals that we use are the DSM-5 and the DC-0-3R. The DSM series is from the uh, uh, American Psychiatric Association, very familiar to lots of people. Lots of folks don't know so much about the DC-0-3R, and so that's a diagnostic classification for birth to three, and it was created by the Institute for Infants, Toddlers, and Their Families, uh, which is an organization in the States called Zero to Three. And so it was organized by a task force of experts throughout the United States. It's been translated into multiple languages. It's used in infant mental health clinics around the world. And it's just actually in the process of being revised again. So I'm not sure what they're going to call it. I'm excited to wait and see what it is. Um, so, but these classification systems basically are lists. They're lists of problems that kind of go together. Um, and then we come up with a label that we call a diagnosis. And um, we have a lot of in-depth discussions as whether diagnoses, do they, are, they, are they real? Do they really exist? They are human uh, fabrication to describe complex behaviors. Um, and they can be helpful, but they're only one part. And the child is not their label. But it's just not. So when we've gone through that priorities list, we come to this at the end. We're at the very end now, after we've done all that assessment, and then we describe what are other areas of concern or behavior that we um, may or may not use labels for. And I've chosen to have a few labels on this list, but not so many. So lots of the little folks that come to us are aggressive, oppositional, or defiant. We have many children that come with a variety of problems with anxiety, separation anxiety, specific phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety, um, and the DC 0 to 3 R describes these very nicely. Um, we have many children that come where we're wondering whether they're going to have a diagnosis of ADHD. We try and prolong giving that label for as long as we can. Uh, we have many children that come with a variety of trauma, uh, medical trauma and other environmentally induced trauma. And then we also see children with very complex developmental challenges. Uh, we do see children in our clinic that come with uh, possible autism spectrum disorders, 
and then we refer them to the Glenrose for a multidisciplinary team assessment. Uh, likewise, we see children that have ex been exposed to a variety of substances, including alcohol, and, and some little guys that come, and gals that come with uh, uh, evolving Tourette's disorder as well. And then we see children that have suffered loss and maybe experiencing grief and some sad little folks who may have not had the serve and return they need um, in their environments. So that's, that's our list of, and we, and we call this section other areas of concern, or, and then we use the word behaviors because that's what parents come in with. These are my child's behaviors. So how do we assess for these wobbles? Well, we start off with a chat, many, many questions, and we have a semi-structured interview that we've developed over time and revise every year. It's a ritual. Um, and then we do observation, and we need to observe the child and parent potentially in our office, but also it's very useful to go out to homes, to preschool, childcare, early education sites, wherever the kid is, and observe them with other folks too, and observe them with their peers. We um, observe um, the child with the caregiver, and sometimes we do a structured observation where we put the, them through a series of tasks. Um, we also may observe the family, and we also have a kind of a structured, semi-structured protocol for that as well. Uh, and then we have a whole variety of questionnaires, checklists, and special interviews that we've collected over the years for if we've identified specific concerns, and then we can kind of hone in in more detail. But the main, the main um, uh, thing we do is we present, we collect all the information, but we discuss it with a team. So the work we do is complex and it's uh, stressful <laughs> some days. Uh, and it's important, I, th I think we found over the years, to have multiple eyes on a situation and discuss it um, together so that we come up with the best, our best sense of what's going on and our best sense of what to do next. So next section, how do we help? So we can help the child directly, we can help the parent with ideas and specific strategies, and we can help the parent reflect and improve their capacity to work uh, on the serve and return with their child. So first help for the child, we make referrals to appropriate resources in the community for the child's health and development and to programs that are appropriate for the child. Occasionally, for children with very specific problems, we may do uh, play individual psychotherapy. Um, and medication, of course, is always the last resort. Information for the care caregiver. We've collected a bunch of resources over the years, and so I've just highlighted a few. Uh, the Simple Gifts series is very useful. It comes from the Infamental uh, Health Promotion Group in Toronto, so we use that. Um, and we have a variety of, of resources that we use. And if we're specifically having the family need information about their coping skills and need for social supports, then we do partner with our community uh, agencies and children's services. And then we have specific information about parenting uh, strategies and, and supporting uh, parents to manage difficult behaviors. And our focus is, uh, with those is always the positive, so the bottom of, the, of um, our, our pyramid of supporting serve and return and positive interactions. And then the research shows that helping parents to reflect and to think about what is in their child's heart and mind is extremely powerful in helping move uh, situations of improving serve and return. And so we spend uh, with our families that are needing this, uh, we spend time supporting their capacity to reflect. And there are different ways that we can do this. So there's infant-led uh, psychotherapy where we use videotape um, um, observations of the interaction of the parent and child together and then we play back the video to the parent so they can see what they're doing well and what they might improve. Um, and then we have a wonderful group that we use called the Circle of Security Parenting Group. We get rave reviews uh, from our parents about how valuable this is and I think as clinicians for our own lives and our own relationships we have also found the circle of security um, paradigm to be extremely informative. And then there are specific psychotherapy uh, strategies for families and children that have experienced trauma and violence and I've alluded to the importance of mindfulness before. So the idea of helping the parent reflect is really building the capacity to think about the other, the others, their partners, their child's thinking and feeling, and to think about their own stress responses, their own thoughts and feelings, 
And so, and the purpose is, to, as I said, to keep that serve and return going, which supports social emotional milestones, which supports all the rest. So the other part uh, that I think is important for families to know is that their experts should provide help in a certain way. And we should explain things carefully and in a way that the parent can understand the child's strengths and challenges. And then we need to make plans together so that parents aren't given the solution, a potential solution, or, or what's going to work. They need to be part of the process of figuring it out with us so that we do uh, our intervention plans together. So last metaphor. Parents ask, how can I help my child be stronger? How can I help them survive in the world so that they can do their best? And the metaphor for resiliency is a scale. So that over time, the more positive factors we build onto a resilient scale, the more we help a child buffer the negatives that are going to come inevitably. We all will have negatives in our lives, stressors, a variety of kinds. And so resilience is having a scale that's tipped to the positive side, even though life is handing you lots of bad stuff on your scale. And here's my little cool resilience scale. I actually did this myself. I'm so proud of it. So we got the scale and the brain you see is this wonderful child's brain is kind of tipped or on the scale to the side where and my son went through the physics of this with me and I just was like, okay, enough of that. But I put the brain on the right side. So that we have positive factors, even though they're smaller, they tip the scale to the positive, even though they're outweighed. And so we can help shape children's brains so they're on the, the right spot of this scale, so that the scale's in the balance. So again, just summarizing, positive outcomes happen when children can be flexible and maintain, maintain this stable functioning over time. So getting back to green, not having the elastic band overstretched. And that's how, the, that's how we have optimal um, brain function and outcomes. And my two last points here are that experiences matter and relationships matter. Last slide, complexity. We deal with this every day. How do we, how do we hold complexity? Because we have families coming with many, many concerns um, and children with a variety of challenges. So development is complex. How we interact with each other is very complex, and our systems that are trying to help are really complex, like really, really complex, some days more than others. And so what I'm finding in my practice is the core story and the neurorelational framework together help us hold this complexity in a way that we can help our families, and they also, I think, support us to be hopeful. So I'd like to thank my uh, team at Infant Preschool Services who inspire me and co-regulate me every day. The uh, East uh, Neighborhood Centre Rundle site staff actually let me practice on them uh, a week and a half ago and gave me some good ideas. My IT team was my son and a dear family friend. And uh, Dr. Connie Lillis, who has been a mentor. She's working with us in Edmonton. She's partnering with us and uh, we have lots of good things that we're cooking up together. So I thank her as well. So questions. So questions, are there any from the, the web? They're shy. Thank you very much. That was really informative. And um, I really liked the framework. That was very helpful. Um, I just have a question. My name is Mary Stewart. And I wondered about the evidence or what's the literature around how that um, we often focus on or supporting the regulation in the child and so how does that sort of that parent-child attunement affect the physiology of the parent say if we're talking about a, a, a parents um, with postpartum depression or something where we're trying to support their um, regulation Does that makes sense so so um, two-way street so we're so yes we, we in infant mental health we're looking at the child's, the infant's regulation, but regulation of the infant always happens in the context of the relationship with the caregiver. So you gave the example, if the mom has postpartum depression and if she's very depressed, um, how does the child co-regulate? Well, potentially the child isn't co-regulated and isn't learning self-regulation like the baby on the tape. 
The stale phase paradigm is actually a paradigm that was created to try and study the possible effects of postpartum depression. So if the infant is presented with a flat face, a parent who's depressed, who's non-responsive, who isn't attuning, so you use the word attunement. Attunement means the parent is, is um, unconsciously, actually millisecond by millisecond, if you look at the research, um, responding to the child's nonverbal cues. And so if that's missing in the interaction, then what happens is, is that the infant is not able to develop the capacity for self-regulation over time. Because as I described, you don't develop self-regulation unless you're co-regulated. And so if we have a parent with severe mental health troubles, depression, uh, more serious illnesses where they are not with us in the real world, um, a parent who's highly anxious, uh, a parent who is hostile or intrusive, there's a whole spectrum of atypical kind of parenting behaviors. What happens is the, infant is the infant's cues are not being noticed and attended to. The nuts and bolts of the interaction aren't happening. And so when the nuts and bolts don't happen, co-regulation doesn't happen, and self-regulation doesn't happen. And so to help the infant self-regulate when a parent is, is ill, we have to help the, the parent be healthy. But we also have to provide the infant with other caregivers because the brain is wiring up. And if it's taking, the time, if it's taking time for the parent's health to stabilize, either physical or mental health, then we have to provide the infant with a caregiver that can help them build those positive memories of inside and outside world um, and self-regulation. And that wiring, I mean, there's opportunities um, to continue to repair those troubles in self-regulation over time, but it, it gets harder and harder. Um, there's always possibilities to help repair. But those lower brain systems that wire up, body and sensations, they're harder to shift over time. We have a question from the web now. We do. Uh, the question is, how, we actually have a couple questions. How do you get a young child to meditate? <laughs> yeah, good question. So, you know, there's a bunch of books, actually. So it's, now, let's just, you, I'm going to use the word meditate in a very general kind of way. <laughs> so there are ways that we actually help children calm their bodies. Um, and there's a series of books by Lori Light, L-I-T-E, uh, Boy and a Turtle, uh, and A Boy and a Bear. And they're wonderful books that help with progressive muscle relaxation and breathing, which are the foundations of meditation. So I, I'm using the word meditation loosely. But there are many, uh, and there, there, it's, there's actually a flood, if you look on the internet, there's just a flood of books out there now. And I included one, which is for older children, and, and I included it. It's written by Goldie Hawn. And it's a lovely little book called uh, 10 Mindful Minutes. Um, but for young children, there's also a variety of different uh, books and tapes to support um, them being calm and slowing down and doing basically mindfulness practices. And so if we teach parents, then they can teach their kids and, the, and do it together. And the other way for children to be mindful uh, and sort of meditate is by doing movement. And so we have many, many of our little gaffers that enjoy yoga. And so we are encouraging parents to put on tapes and do yoga with their young children. And we have lots of kids that really enjoy that. And for children that are anxious, it can make a huge difference in, in their self-regulation strategies. So I don't know about other parents in the room, but I'm going to go home after this and try and meditate with my six-year-old daughter. There, there you, you go. Are. Six, six absolutely able to do mindfulness strategies. Well, we also find that yoga already actually works quite well with her. They do it at school with them and they yes. do it at daycare and yeah. obviously for good reason. Absolutely. So uh, somebody just made a comment that they don't know about everyone else, but they're still processing so much wonderful information to be able to find a question. They'll probably have one in about an hour from now. <laughs> um, Okay. But one that uh, is actually from rural Saskatchewan that I'm sure would apply to rural Albertans is, I work in health promotion. I work with child care providers, caregivers, and community organizations. Being in rural Saskatchewan, we lack those specialized professionals. What can we do if there's no one to refer to? Yeah, very, very good question. So, unfortunately, uh, in... Um, 
most of the world, there are not um, infant mental health services available. There just aren't. Uh, so we're lucky in our region, in Edmonton, that we do have um, an integrated infant mental health service. Um, our service actually has um, a component of rural outreach through our community geographic team. And uh, Marlene Hogan is actually in the room and she's uh, the therapist who's uh, doing infant mental health consultation to rural sites. Um, so I know in Saskatchewan specifically, Esther Churland is an infant psychiatrist at the University of um, Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And um, she works with a team of clinicians, but I'm not sure how much rural outreach they do. I don't think they do any. Um, so it means driving. And for a lot of our families in Alberta, if their child has a complex um, problem uh, with, uh, within the, the child's mental health, then often they, we, we have families that travel long distances. And we've talked over time about the, the possibility of doing telehealth, but it's very, it would be very difficult to do the work we do by telehealth. So I think the hope is over the long term is to really seriously look at how we train more clinicians out in rural mental health clinics to be able to identify um, struggles for young children and families and to be able to provide some intervention. Uh, early. Because what we're finding on our team is if we do um, interventions early enough, and some of the interventions can be provided by childcare providers, by uh, um, early intervention folks in the field. If we do those interventions early, then we pre and we, we prevent the little wobbles from, be from becoming big wobbles. Um, and likewise, I think we need to educate our healthcare providers um, about mental health. Because if we operate in isolation and not in an integrated way, not integrating body and brain functioning, then we miss out on so many opportunities to promote uh, children's mental health from the very, very beginning. Good morning. Um, if I may ask a question, my name is Tammy Downs and I'm a family support worker and I work um, in a parent link center on the west side of Edmonton. I'm wondering, I have two, a two part question. Uh, the first one is I'm wondering if you ever uh, use supplements uh, under the holistic health uh, for these families and the children because you do state that you use medication as a last resort or uh, connect them to doctors that would prescribe that. And then um, do you want me to let you answer that? And then sure, I'll, thank that would do it one at a time. Okay, so with regards to supplements, uh, lots of families that come to us are giving their children a variety of supplements. Um, most common are omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, which there is some evidence to show that they um, can be very helpful. Um, and then what we're finding in our, in our clinic, actually, um, we need to do a study about this. So we're actually pondering that right now as to how we can study this. But we have many children coming to us with low iron. And iron is essential for uh, good quality sleep as well as brain development. And there are many other uh, nutritional components, of course, to good good quality brain development. So uh, we have many families that come to us uh, where we need to talk to them about iron supplementation. And many families that do actually are giving their children a variety of different supplements or holistic health remedies. Um, so that is not our area of expertise, the supplements in general. So we recommend that they talk to folks in the community that are. Um, and we don't discourage families from sorting out alternative health uh, practices. Um, Every family is on their own journey and has to find out what works. Um, and we do talk to families about nutrition in, in general terms. And for some children with uh, more serious nutritional concerns, we do refer them to dietitians. Um, because again, you can't do one without the others. All parts are important to thank, health. Thank you very much. I was not aware that uh, iron was a deficiency in a lot of these young people. It, again, that's not my expertise, but I am doing some research on iodine right now. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I find it very interesting stuff. My second part question is um, regarding uh, your recommendations and our parenting strategies. Is Triple P one of the ones that you recommend? And I didn't see it there. I'm sorry. Maybe it was there and I didn't see it. <laughs> no, you didn't see it, and okay. I'm sorry. And it's under. It comes under the family. Triple P. Too. Okay, so now I'm going to give a major plug for Triple P. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually. Triple that P too. is so important. Yes, I'm sorry, and I will change it on my slide tonight. Um, I forgot about Triple P. It's hugely important, um, and it's a very, very valuable, valuable resource. And so. With some of the families that come to us, we will send them to Triple P, absolutely, into their parent link centers, which have, 
you know, a wide variety of valuable resources. And we have many, many families that come to us having done triple P and then they need the next steps. Um, but for those who haven't, then we'll send them back for that foundational information because triple P is very solid in Great. supporting serve and return and co-regulation. Thank you very much. So I have another question from the web and that is, and you may have just said it with the triple P as being one of those tools, but how do we help children in childcare who return to toxic environments every evening and weekend when parents are not ready to access support themselves? Well, that's a daily difficult question as to how we support families um, that, are, that are struggling. And I guess it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's back to the metaphor of you can't do one without the others. And I think as communities and as a society, we need to look at ways to reach families that are hard to engage. And the only way that we're going to really do that effectively is that if, if we work together. Um, so, for example, um, in Edmonton, we have a pilot project uh, called CATCH, Collaborative Assessment and Treatment for Children's Health. And it's a partnership between infant mental health, um, the Stollery, um, physical health, Glen Rose, developmental health, and children's services. And the attempt is to have kind of a wraparound approach for young families in the community that are really struggling. And it's hard work. It is very, very hard work to integrate all the helpers to come together to provide supports for young families. Um, so I think this aspect of our work for those of us in different parts of the field at the, on the front lines it's very difficult to watch children suffering in their home environments. And I think what I would suggest to uh, folks that are in childcare, in early intervention, early education programs, is that to know that for the time that the child is with you, you are providing optimal serve and return and co-regulation. And you are a huge, or you, you are providing a huge impact on that child's brain development of supporting resiliency so that every day that a child is in a good quality child care, getting those um, educational uh, inputs, we are building resiliency. So I think that's what we need to take heart on. We all are doing our best and, and we are um, helping children's brain development. Um, question from the room? Sorry, so just in the spirit of optimizing serve and return amongst the children and parents, I'm just wondering if you have any helpful resources for workers, but also for parents on the education regarding television, uh, the video games, and that interaction with that kind of media. Um, good question. So, um, technology does not uh, contribute to serve and return. Um, unless you're doing games, so there are there's some opportunities. So I'm because I, I can't um, down gaming because I have individuals in my family who really like it. So there are opportunities for serve and return uh, when we play games, uh, whether they're um, board games, old fashioned kind of games, or or video games using technology. So there's ways to build that in with children, um, so that you can have back and forth and share joy and have lots of fun and make it interactive and a social event. Um, where I think we have concerns is where children are playing repetitive games, solitary, by themselves, watching TV by themselves for hours and hours. There's no serve and return happening there with the, with the, with the television, with the screen. Um, there may be some learning happening, uh, and certainly video games are excellent for eye-hand coordination, and they, they do build skills, but they, they're not building social skills necessarily, especially when they're done in a solitary way. So the Canadian Pediatric Association and the American Pediatric Association and child psychiatry um, um, folks, it, it's unanimous among professionals in the field that too much technology too early is not good for brain development. And so I think the Canadian Pediatric Society says none under two years of age and then really to limit it in the preschool years, so not more than like an hour a day. But most children get way, way, way more than that. So. To resources to educate parents, um, there are so there, there is like there are bulletins. So if you go online, there are position statements from those organizations about technology. Um, they have um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry has a whole series of information called Facts for Families about um, um, parenting as well as uh, 
basic information about mental health disorders. So that, that can be actually a really, really good resource. Other question? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I work within early learning in the school system, uh, supporting families. And uh, we're finding that um, with diagnosis, uh, the concept of, of diagnosing children, um, families are resistant or hesitant to that idea and will kind of put the brakes on in the process for fear of a diagnosis coming out. And we're finding that a lot of supports are also dependent on that diagnosis. And so just wondering your thoughts on how best we can be supporting families through that process um, and supporting them maybe in those beginning stages. So the question is with regards to um, diagnosing children early and needing labels for funding. So it's wrong. <laughs> uh, I'll just say that. And um, you know, our educational system is theoretically we're moving to a system where we're using more functional descriptions of children's needs and their strengths and challenges. And so then we're providing children what they need in an educational setting based on that kind of descriptive information and less so with based on a label. And so I think for families who are hesitant and reluctant, I think that that is, is uh, healthy. I think that's a healthy response to a system that is not functional. So I think um, as folks in the system, we have to keep moving towards uh, functional descriptions and less of this need to label and fund to the label. So that would be my position on that. And I think, I think parents, they're, they're right in resisting labels because labels, as I described, they're, they're an artificial creation. And, and labels don't necessarily, they don't describe the whole child. And unfortunately, when we give children labels, we don't, we don't describe the child. We don't, we don't say what a wonderful child this is and all their strengths. We focus on, on negative. Um, and and the, the other problem with labels, I could rant on for a long time, you could tell. The other problem is, is that um, every child is unique within the diagnosis. So I work in the autism clinic, autism spectrum disorder. Every child with autism is unique. And so the label, I mean, me knowing that they have autism doesn't tell me who is going to come in and visit me that day. It just doesn't. Uh, that would conclude our questions from the webcast. The only last comment that I was going to make is just going back a step about the technology. Um, the Alberta Centre for Child, Family and Community Research actually sponsored a two-part series that's uh, taken place over the last four years with the Alberta Teachers Association, mm -hmm. Disconnected and Connected. And it actually looks at the use of technology by preschool children, um, school age children, and teenagers. The good, the bad, the ugly. And it features uh, research experts from across Canada and the United States. So if anyone is interested in watching that series, um, I will actually include a link to it uh, with this event with my follow-up email. Lovely. Thank you, Amy.